Kilwa Kiziwani and Songo Manara are two islands situated close to each other off the Tanzanian coast, about 280 kilometers to the south of Dar es Salaam. The history of the impressive sites of Kilwa Kiziwani and Songo Manara, which reflect multiple and rich cultural identities, is largely unknown to the people of Tanzania. The islands are two archaeological sites of prime importance to the understanding of the Swahili culture, the Islamization of the east coast of Africa, and the extensive commerce of the medieval period and modern era. The East African Plateau, most of Tanzania in fact, is covered by open grassland, woodland and savanna. On each island, a complex of ruins has been preserved, which are presently under the protection of the government of the Republic of Tanzania. The standing ruins of Kilwa Kiziwani represent a slice through East African history, from the high point of the Swahili civilization through its decline under Portuguese control, to annexation by the Omani Empire based in Zanzibar. Structures survive from all of these periods, making Kilwa Kiziwani one of the foremost built heritage sites in East Africa. Among the monuments, we find ruins comprising the Gereza, a Swahili term meaning prison. It was constructed on the ruins of a fortress originally constructed by the Portuguese in less than three weeks. The Gereza Fort, originally built in the 14th century and rebuilt by the Omani Arabs in the 19th century, is a large square building built of coral set in lime. The walls are very thick with circular towers at the northeast and southwest corners. It has an impressive entrance with fine wood carving. The only battle the Gereza faces is the continual encroachment of natural forces. Wind and sea have eaten into its once powerful stone. Its courtyards are turning to grass, and high on its tower, Baobab has taken root. The other two important buildings on Kilwa Island are also defensive structures, although they seem to date mostly to the 18th century. The largest of these is the Mukotani Palace, which served as a residence of the Sultan in the 18th century. This building is contained within a fortified enclosure known as the Mukutani, which consists of two curtain walls fortified by square towers with embrasures. The wall was originally approximately three meters high and crenellated. Although there is no trace of a parapet, this could have been built of wood like many other features of the 18th century remains at Kilwa. The palace occupies a position between the two enclosure walls and appears to be built around one of the earlier towers. It is the only building on the island still to have an upper floor, which once contained the main residential area of the palace. The history of the city is reflected in the surviving buildings, although it should be remembered that the number of stone buildings was small compared to a majority made out of less permanent materials. The main building materials on the island were the same as elsewhere on the coast and included reef and fossil coral that were used as stone, mangrove poles for wood, and coconut palms for roofing.
To the east of the main group of buildings are the remains known as Husuni Kuba, Large Husuni, and Husuni Nudogo, Small Husuni. The term Husuni derives from the Arabic term Husun, meaning fortified enclosure or fortress. While this term may be appropriate for the latter, its application to Husuni Kuba seems unlikely for a palace complex. Husuni Kuba is located on a coastal headland overlooking the Indian Ocean. It seems to date mostly from the late 13th or early 14th century and may well have never been completed. The complex consists of three main elements the gateway or monumental entrance, the large south court, and a complex of four courtyards that form the core of the palace. The royal nature of the palace is confirmed by a floriated Kufic inscription found during excavations that mentions Sultan al Hassan bin Suleiman. Husuni Kuba consists of a rectangular structure lined north-south and measuring over 70 meters long by more than 50 meters wide. Thirteen evenly spaced, solid, semicircular bastions protect the outside of the wall with one rectangular tower on the west side. Excavations have revealed the traces of a few structures inside, but these may be later additions and do not give any indication of the function of the building itself, which is unparalleled elsewhere in East Africa and suggests an outside influence. There is little evidence for dating this structure, although it is thought to be contemporary with Huzuni Kubwa. Although East Africa has been Islamic for more than 1,000 years, the towns or settlements do not contain all the elements usually found in a Muslim town. Before the Portuguese period, there do not seem to have been significant attempts to fortify towns with walls, and there are few examples of fortified buildings before this period, with the enigmatic exception of Husuni Nudogo. This building, Husuni Dunogo, was constructed in the 15th century. The complex, which is estimated to date from the 12th century or earlier, is set on a hill and must have once commanded great views over the bay. The north set of steps leads to a further residential unit overlooking the sea and the small mosque. It is possible that the sea mosque and the staircase represent the Sultan's private entry to the palace. The ruins of Kilwa Kiziwani are by far the most important. The site was occupied from the 9th century to the 19th century and reached its peak in the 13th and 14th centuries. In 1332, the great traveler Ibn Battuta made a stop here and described Kilwa as one of the most beautiful cities in the world. Thereafter, Cabral and Vasco de Gama were content only to call it its port but Francisco d'Almeida seized it in 1505 and established a fortress there. The Portuguese named it the island of Puiloa, and it is by this name that it was known in the West. The town's wealth depended on trade in ivory and other goods, but the most important commodity was gold. The wealth brought in by the gold trade meant that Kiowa had its own mint and was the only place in sub-Saharan Africa to issue coins. However, the arrival of the Portuguese at the beginning of the 16th century brought an abrupt end to the prosperity of the city. During the 17th century, the city seems to have declined, becoming a very small settlement. It was only with the establishment of an Ombani base there in the 18th century that the city again rose to prosperity. 
By the 19th century, the city had again declined to the point where the administrative center was moved to the mainland settlement of Kiowa Kevinje. In 2004, the ruins of the great seaports of Kiowa Kiziwani and Songo Marara were inscribed on the list of World Heritage in Danger by the World Heritage Committee. The ruins are particularly affected by sea erosion, lack of maintenance that is leading to the collapse of buildings, inadequate management, and demographic pressure. Given the rapid deterioration of archaeological and monumental heritage of these two islands, it has become imperative to take affirmative action to restore, conserve, and develop the sites in a realistic and sustainable manner. There are three Kiwas. The oldest is Kiwa Kiziwani, which lies on a small island. This is where the ruins of the medieval city of Kiwa are located, and where the legend of King Solomon's mines originated. Kiwa Kiziwani is famous for its ruins, and the finest and most intact of Islamic architecture. Kiwa Masako lies on a peninsula and is the local area's administrative and commercial center. The inhabitants are a distillation of the nations of travelers, pilgrims, fishermen, explorers, and merchants who stopped here over the centuries. Fishing has long been an important source of income and nutrition to the people of Kiowa district. There are over 1,700 registered local fishermen who use nearly 600 small boats. The harbor at Kiwa Masoko is a starting point for atmospheric dow trips to the neighboring Kiwa Kiziwani UNESCO World Heritage Site. The best known building in Kiwa is the Great Mosque, a large complex structure dating from several periods. The building consists of two main parts, a small northern part divided into 16 bays, and a larger southern extension divided into 30 bays. When the Great Mosque was built in the 11th century, it would have been a small construction with a design typical of the Swahili coast, with a flat roof supported on nine 16-sided wooded columns in rows of three. The growing demand for gold in India and Europe and resultant prosperity of the port, three centuries later, in 1320 saw the mosque dramatically enlarged to reflect the increased status of the town and crowned with its charismatic domes. These would have been influenced by the growing awareness of international architectural styles practiced on the opposite shores of the Indian Ocean. The finished design became the glory of the coast. Unfortunately, the elegant eight-sided pillars were not strong enough to support an ambitiously large dome on the southeast corner. And after the roof began to crumble, these were reconstructed with slightly less refined coral limestone blocks. As with the other vaults from Kilwa, the Great Mosque's vaults and domes are constructed out of lime coal concrete. These domes are about 20 to 30 centimeters thick and shaped into hemispheres supported by groin squinches between which run pointed arches. These arches are supported by two-tiered columns that are octagonal at their base and become square halfway up. Adjacent to the Great Mosque on the south side is a Great House, which mostly dates to the same period as the latest phase of the mosque in the 18th century. The Great House actually consists of three connected residential units, each with a sunken central courtyard. The purpose of the Great House is not known, but it is likely that at some stage it served as a sultan's residence, judging from a royal tombstone found during excavations. The eastern coasts of Africa changed profoundly around the close of the first millennium AD, first because Bantu-speaking peoples from the interior migrated and settled along the coast, from Kenya to South Africa, and secondly, because merchants and traders from the Muslim world in India realized the strategic importance of the east coast of Africa for commercial traffic and began to settle there. 
From 900 AD onwards, the east coast of Africa saw an influx of Shirazi Arabs from the Persian Gulf, and even small settlements of Indians. The Arabs called this region Al-Zanji, the Blacks, and the coastal area slowly came under the control of Muslim merchants from Arabia and Persia. By the 1300s, the major East African ports from Mombasa in the north to Sofala in the south had become thoroughly Islamic cities and cultural centers. The language that grew out of the mix of Arabs and Bantu is one of the most common languages that is a combination of two or more languages. Swahili or Kiswahili from the Arabic word Sawahil which means coast. To the southwest of the Great Mosque is a small domed mosque that together with the Jangwani Mosque are the only two examples of a nine domed mosque in this area. The small domed mosque is a miniature of the Great Mosque. This ruin has a fascinating and unusual charm, with a neat symmetrical nine-domed square flanked by a tiny washing room. The ceiling inside is carved with small rondelles that were once filled with colorful oriental ceramics, and the roof is crowned with an impressive stone obelisk that has since broken off. The other nine-domed mosque is of approximately the same date and is known as the Jangwani Mosque. It is located to the south of the small domed mosque. Although more ruinous, excavation has shown this mosque to be similar, with the same use of fluted and plain domes and entrances only on the south and east sides. This mosque was unique for having ablution water jars set into the walls just inside the main entrance. Kilwa district has an abundance of natural resources, and the vast majority of its people are reliant on natural resources to meet their daily needs. Farmers rely on traditional tools and methods. For example, fields are cultivated by hand using hose and irrigation. For water, people depend on rivers or local wells. Most villages have only one well, where all families fetch their water. The inhabitants' housing is often rather primitive. Most people live in small huts made of bamboo and clay, roofed with palm leaves or grasses. Houses are mostly used for sleeping only. Cooking and socializing is done in the streets. Songo Manara was a central participant in Indian Ocean commerce during the 15th and 16th centuries facilitating exchange of goods from the African continent with traders from ports in the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, and Western India. The importance of this site is underscored by its inclusion on the UNESCO World Heritage Site List. The ruins of Songo Manara date to at least the 15th century or earlier, and these older ruins were reoccupied by the Omani settlers in the 18th century. 
Sangomenara is dominated by the well-preserved remains of more than 40 large domestic room blocks, five mosques, and numerous tombs. Room blocks wrap around and enclose an open central area of the site, where tombs, a walled cemetery, and a small mosque are located. The stone ruins of the town are quiet and empty. They have been that way since the 16th century, when the people who built this place departed. But despite its age, the town remains remarkably untouched by time, or the hands of scavengers and looters who frequently mar the integrity of sites that contain tantalizing clues to humankind's past. Two factors make Songo Manara particularly interesting. The first is its condition. The ruins of many Swahili towns can be found elsewhere on the coast, but people either live in them or take the stones to construct other buildings. But Songa Manara is so isolated that it has remained relatively untouched, even by archaeologists. Most of the rubble from the buildings remains, and the walls stand all over the site. It is a remarkable time capsule. The second interesting factor about Songa Manara is that it dates to the last century or so before the Portuguese assumed dominance over Indian Ocean trade. Songa Manara may not be as interesting in terms of the long-term transformation of Swahili culture, but it gives us a focused view of the 15th and 16th centuries. The name Songo is ancient, but Manara is a relatively modern word, meaning tower, and refers to the tall but collapsed minaret of the main 15th century mosque. A large labyrinthine building with beautiful arches and doors is generally referred to as a sultan's palace, but since this island had no sultan, it was probably the secondary residence of the sultan of Kilwa. The houses have a standardized design, with a monumental entrance approached by a flight of steps, leading via an anteroom into a sunken courtyard, to the south of which are the main living quarters of the house. The dominant typology discovered was that of a single-story unit, with entrance lobbies that led into sunken courtyards. The main building materials were coral, mangrove, coconut thatch, and mud, all of which were easily available on the coast. In the absence of any other suitable form of stone on the coast, Core was employed as the main building material for stone houses. Tune made types were used, reef coral quarried live from the sea and fossil coral, which formed the main rock underlying the coast. Usually reef coral was used for the finer decorative elements of a building, while fossil coral was used for the walls, although there are certain variations on this. Coral was also burnt and used to make lime for plaster and mortar. Mangrove poles were the main type of timber used and were available in considerable quantities as any coastal settlement would involve the clearance of large areas of mangrove. The standard dimensions of mangrove poles are between 1.8 and 2.8 meters long, imposing a maximum span on roofs without supports. Coconut palm was used as a thatch to roof mud-walled houses and to build temporary fishing shelters. Red mud earth was used either as a building material for walls and wattle and daub constructions, or as floor makeup within stone houses. In most places and at most periods throughout the coast, mud wattle and daub constructions would have been the predominant form of construction, while stone was only used for special purposes. The small objects made of earthenware that have been gathered during the excavations bear exceptional testimony to the commercial and consequently cultural exchanges of which Kilwa, and to a lesser extent, Songo were the theater. Cowrie shells, pearls of glass, carnelian or quartz were interfaced with porcelain of the Song dynasty as a medium of exchange from the 12th century. The Kilwa area is characterized by endless white beaches dotted with tall swaying palms, remote islands whose inhabitants cross to and from the mainland in dhows with billowing white sails, 
and any number of time-warped Swahili ports evoking the area's long history of maritime trade. Yet the haunted ruins that remain more than four centuries later form an unmatched and compelling example of medieval Swahili architecture, one that was inscribed as Tanzania's second UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1981.